Father, we pray that you may speak to our hearts through this precious word that you've prepared for your people. Holy Spirit, we pray that you may move in this place and do a work in all those who are going to listen now and later too, in Jesus' name. The title of the Bible study is The Three Generations of the Flood. 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 Noah's Flood. We're going to hear a lot of new things. I don't like restating what we have heard many times, so almost 99% of what you hear will be things that you've never heard before. Okay, shall we turn to Matthew's Gospel chapter 24, Matthew 24, verse 36, Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now I believe all of you have flown by plane to different places. If you are going to fly to some other country, you'll have somebody there who is going to pick you up. So you have to inform them certain things. If you tell them the flight number, is it enough? That same flight may come several days. So an important thing that you have to tell them is the date of your arrival and the time of your arrival. Jesus here is talking of the most important flight in history. It is called the rapture, the secret coming of Jesus, the most important flight. And strangely, he leaves out exactly those two details. You will not know the day nor the time of my coming. No one knows. But then he leaves a clue with us. It will be like the days of Noah. We all know that Jesus is going to return. We do not know the day or the hour, but the clue given to us is that it will be like Noah's time. Let us look a little closer at this clue for the rest of the Bible study because that's the whole focus of the study. So let me begin with a question. I'd like to, a Bible study to be a bit interactive. So if I ask a question, then you should try and answer. Okay? All right. My first question is, how many children did Adam and Eve have? Three. It's a good attempt. I commend that. We know that Adam and Eve had two sons to begin with, and their names are Cain and Abel. But then a tragedy took place where Cain killed Abel, and then there were how many sons left? One. But after this, according to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, another son was born, and his name was? Seth. So now, how many children did Adam and Eve have? Totally. Three. Okay, because Abel's still alive with God, so don't discount him. So now, Adam and Eve have three kids. So you're right, but you're wrong. Because if you read Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, and Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were eight hundred years and he begat sons and daughters. You will see after Seth, they had more children. Can you read that? What does it say? Sons. sons. That's plural, right? Yes. So how many is it? Sons. When you say sons, how many is that? More than one. So, at least two. Okay? Until now we said Adam and Eve had three children. Now we read sons. That means at least two more. 
So how many now? Five, at least five. And daughters, so how many there? Again, minimum two. So Adam and Eve had at least? At least seven children. Good, you're doing your math correctly. So Adam and Eve had at least seven children. So I'm sorry, your three is uh, not very complete. But from the traditional sources, Josephus quotes from an old tradition that Adam and Eve together had at least 33 sons and 23 daughters. So this is not in the Bible, but this is from tradition and history. So if Adam and Eve had so many children, and you know in those days how long each one lived, and they all had so many children, by the time of Noah's time, some say the population was over seven billion because they were so many in number. What is our population today over that? So, like the days of Noah will also the days of the Son of Man be, in terms of population, we are in Noah's time. Is that clear? Okay, that's just the starters. Now, because Abel died, the two main sons of Adam were Cain and Seth. And from them came two main generations that fill the world. The generation of Cain and the generation of Seth. These are the fathers of the two main generations in the world. We know how a father plays a vital role in the family and so the generation will be like the father. What is the first thing mentioned about Cain in this episode in chapter 4 verse 16? The first thing mentioned about Cain is... And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. This is the first thing mentioned about Cain. And what is that? Cain went out of God's presence. If a father goes out from God's presence, it radically affects the child. All the fathers must therefore think about that. What was the result on his generation? The genealogy of Cain, that is, his sons and his grandchildren and so on, they are mentioned in chapter 4 from 17 to 24. You don't have to read it. You can look at it at this slide. This is Cain's genealogy from chapter 4, 17 to 24, to the seventh generation. We read of their names, Enoch, but that is not the Enoch we know of and the rest of it. What do we understand, know about Cain's generation? They were inventors and they were builders, pioneers, musicians, blacksmiths, singers, and so on. So all those are the children, the men, and Lamech had two wives, Ada and Zillah, and their children were Jabel, Jubal, Tubal-Cain, and Naamah. And you can see what a talented family they were. Cain's generation were filled with talented people. The first tent maker or builder and farmer, the first musician, a harp player and organist, the first blacksmith and the first singer of Lamentations. These were all in the generation of Cain. We can say therefore that this was a talented, a brilliant generation. They were the most clever people of the time. 
There's something else we know about this generation, that this entire generation was wiped out by the flood. Not one of them was alive. Why? Because the Bible describes this generation in another place. Chapter 6, verse 5. Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God was watching them, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. A brilliant generation, but an evil generation generation. Can we see the similarity in the world today? In today's world where AI is taking over, we see the brilliance of man reaching its culmination. Man is so full of wisdom and yet it's a world full of evil and crime and sin. Exactly like the days of Noah. We are also living in that, in that same time. So we can see how Cain's generation was filled with sin and violence. But let's look at the other generation. The generation of Seth was very different. Is it clear so far? Yes. All right. Now I will tell you about the generation of Seth. And then I'm going to ask you a question that will be so shocking, if you have a heart, it, will, it might stop. It is something you have not thought about, and it will trouble you very much. The generation of Seth was very different. What does the Bible tell us about this generation? In, you read that of them in chapter 5, from verse 6 onwards. This generation, they were called the sons of God. Very different from the generation of Cain. Generation of Cain was evil continually, but these were called the sons of God. And if you look at the names, shall we read out the names aloud together? Go on, start. Adam, Seth, Enos, Cainan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. Okay. All the saints in that time belong to this generation. If you look at it spiritually, what do we see? Spiritually, the birth of Adam or, you know, we know that Adam is a shadow of Christ. Because Christ is called the first Adam or second Adam? Second. No, he's called the last Adam, not second Adam. The reason he's called the last Adam and not the second Adam is if you say second Adam, that implies there may be a need of a third Adam. But when you say last Adam, means we don't need another Adam. So Jesus is the last Adam. So the birth of Adam is a shadow of the birth of Christ. And the birth of Noah, or the last in that generation, is a shadow of the return of Christ, which really is the church period from Christ to his return, is the period of grace or the church period. And we are in the times of Noah, which means we are in the last generation. We are in the time where Jesus can make his dramatic return. It clearly tells us how we are in that time when we should have our minds thinking about the rapture. It was in this generation that many spiritual things happened. One is that Enoch began to walk with God. We have all heard about this, but as I told you, you're going to hear of things that you never heard before. Enoch walked with God. Walk implies a steady relationship and not just a casual acquaintance. It's not just that 
you just meet a person now and then and you know him but no walk means a steady relationship as we heard yesterday Enoch walked with God we all would love to be like Enoch to walk with God but how did it happen did Enoch walk with God from his birth you don't know well I will tell you the answer is no in fact Enoch did not walk with God for the first 65 years of his life. And then the Bible says he started walking with God. What brought the change in Enoch's life? Very good. But I will explain to you. You see, the Bible tells us exactly when Enoch started walking with God. Please read Genesis chapter 5 verse 21 and 22 and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters okay so note that word after Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. So there was a starting point for Enoch to walk with God. What brought about this great change in Enoch's life? The Bible doesn't tell it, but I shall make an educated guess. I think it is Methuselah's birth. The Spirit of God was moving in this generation according to Genesis chapter 6 verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. So the Holy Spirit was working in that generation, striving with people. That means the Spirit of God was seeking to convict the people. I told you about the generation of Cain. They were living in rampant sin, in a very profligate lifestyle. And the Holy Spirit as we know, God is righteous. He is just in giving everyone an opportunity. He was striving with people. So he was moving in the generation of Cain, striving with them. But with the generation of Seth, the Spirit of God was speaking to them. So I believe as Enoch was walking with God, the Spirit of God was also moving there and must have revealed to Enoch the meaning of Methuselah. We know how in the Bible people give names to their children very meaningfully. What is the meaning of Methuselah? No father would give a name like that unless the Spirit of God told him to. The meaning of Methuselah is that when he dies, the flood will begin. That is the meaning of Methuselah. When this child dies, the judgment will come. Imagine when Methuselah had a fever. <laughs> How much they would have been worried, please, please let him not die. I did a personal calculation and I found that the day Methuselah died, that same time the flood began. It was perfect. But also think about this. The fact, how old was Methuselah when he died? He lived up to 969 years. Methuselah is the oldest man who ever lived. What does that show? That shows how patient God was with those people. When he dies, my judgment will begin. But his death lingered and lingered until he was 969. That shows the long-suffering nature of God. We read of that in Peter. That God was long-suffering, bearing, bearing. And we see that in God today also. Easily the judgment could begin. But God is long-suffering and bearing. When Methuselah was born, the Spirit of God might have revealed the meaning of Methuselah. And Enoch, being a spiritual man in his generation, he realized the significance of his son's birth. And he began to walk with God. And the fact that he walked 300 years and he was caught up, that means he walked with God for the rest of his life. To walk with God is not the performance of a day, but it is the business of a lifetime. 
You don't walk with God whenever you feel like it. A relationship with God is not like a relationship in the world. It is a committed relationship. It is a covenantal relationship. And so during those 300 years of walking with God, Enoch was in a deep, intimate relationship with God. At the same time, he had sons and daughters. So he was not living like a monk in some mountains, but he was a family man just like us. But he was walking with God. And I believe all his sons and daughters, this entire generation of Seth, they were all saints. Now Enoch, one of Enoch's sons, as I already told you, was Methuselah. Methuselah too had sons and daughters. One of his sons was Lamech. Now Lamech too had sons and daughters. And one of his sons was Noah. Noah. Now here is a, it's not that question that's going to stop your heart, but this is something before that. Did you know? Now we know that Noah's time the flood began. When Noah's father, who's Noah's father? Lamech. When Lamech was born, Adam's son Seth was still alive. He was quite young. He was only 744 years old. Seth was alive. In fact, Seth and Lamech lived together for 168 years. So imagine how long those people lived. Do you like to live that long? You all want to die, huh? <laughs> okay. Family problems. <laughs> okay. So Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Seth, they all those families lived together. What an awesome fellowship. What an awesome company of saints. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can imagine how wonderful this company of saints was. Are you ready for my question? Okay, fasten your seat belts. All saints walking with God. My question is, why didn't this great company of saints enter the ark? This entire company who lived as saints together 160 years. So much of fellowship, praying together, knowing God together, walking with God together. It is about this generation we read that they did not enter the ark. Think about it. The saints of that time, not one of them entered the ark. They were not the sinners of Genesis 6. That is the generation of Cain. This is the generation of Seth. And what is their sin? Can you read off the screen what is their sin? They were eating. So hereafter, don't eat. <laughs> Singapore is a food paradise. But they were eating. So no eating, all right? No drinking. No marrying. No giving in marriage. Are these things wrong? These things are not sin. But why does Jesus say this? They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. 
we need to know what was in the heart of Jesus when he said this. It was not a sin. What they were doing was not sin, but it is that they were so busy in their daily activities that Noah, when he was preaching, Noah was preaching at this time. For 100 years, Noah was warning, the flood is coming. Like we say, Jesus is coming. But the people, in the, these saints and generations of Seth, even though they were the spiritual people of that time, their heart was hard. When your heart is hard, what happens? You, if you hear a certain truth, you will not respond to it. If you hear you must forgive your enemy, your heart will say, huh. if, you, if your heart is hard and you hear Jesus is coming soon, then your heart will say, oh, I've heard this so many times. That's a sign that your heart is hard. So this generation, their heart became hard. How do we know? The very next verse, Matthew 24, 39 says, They were eating and drinking and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Noah was saying, A flood is coming. The Spirit of God has told me, A rain is coming. And that is why I'm preparing this ark. They heard those words and yet knew not until the flood came. That shows they lived in that blindness and ignorance. So you can be a saint. You can be in the generation of Seth. And yet you can be out of the ark. And Jesus said, so shall it be during the coming of the Son of Man. Which means right now. In our time, in our generation, we can be like this. So, do you belong to the generation of Cain? But are you in the generation of Seth? It can be, right? We all can be in that generation. So this is a wake-up call. Let's proceed. Now, Noah was preaching for about a hundred years telling the people that a flood was coming when suddenly God spoke to Noah and said, no Noah, 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 stop it, stop it, stop it, enough, 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 enough of preaching. Enough of preaching. Enough of preaching. Enough of preaching. So Noah stopped preaching and he entered the ark. Genesis chapter 7 verse 10 tells us something and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth okay what did you understand from this it didn't start drizzling while noah was outside it didn't start raining noah entered the ark and the door was shut and for seven days it didn't rain this is history's first lockdown. They were shut inside and they were told something is happening outside but nothing really was happening outside. I wonder if we were in that family after two or three days, Dad, I'm fed up, I'm going out. Nothing is happening, it's all a lie, isn't it? So I do appreciate that Noah's sons and the daughters-in-law all stayed in and waited. God had a purpose in all this. We may lose patience, but God had a purpose in this. It's not part of this study. It's part of another study why that delay took place. But I want you to observe what happened. Seven days no flood, but we know the nature of rain. Rain doesn't just appear suddenly out of a blue sky. Before it can rain, there is going to be a red alert. There will be winds. You can smell the rain. You will know the signs. So 
I believe seven days there were no floods, but probably the clouds would have begun on day four. Maybe the winds on day five. And maybe the rain started on day six. So let us use our imagination. The waters of the floods on day seven. So for six days, we know it didn't start immediately, but by day four, it looked like something is happening. So the question is this. Why did not any of Noah's brothers, Lamech's children, siblings of Noah, who heard all this, why didn't they start knocking at the door before day seven? Well, maybe they did. You know, if you were there and you saw, hey, this wind, these clouds, it's all strange. It looks like Noah's prophecy is going to take place. I'm getting scared. Noah, Noah, please open. If you were Noah's siblings and knocking, would you want Noah to open it? If you were Noah and your siblings were knocking, would you open it? Good. So why didn't Noah open it? The reason why Noah didn't open was because Noah didn't shut it. Noah had no authority over the door. Who shut the door? The Bible says it was God who shut it. Verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Okay, so Noah, leave Noah out. Why didn't God open the door when they knocked? Imagine you're on the other side and God says, I... I've shut the door. I've lost the key. I can't open. God, please, God, please, please. And said, no, no, no. It's like God's heart is harder than this generation, isn't it? So why didn't God open the door? It's amazing how united you all are. Not one opening your mouth. Go on, guess. Because the water will come inside the ship. <laughs> hmm. God didn't open the door because the water would come inside before the people. No, the floods hadn't come up so high that time. You know, on the sixth day or the fifth day, it was a lot of wind, not floods yet. So why didn't God open? Simple answer. And you know the answer. It's just that your brain cells are a bit inactive. Do you know why God didn't open? Because no one knocked. I already told you, they knew not until the flood came. That means even when there were winds and clouds, they still didn't think. Like, you know, sometimes we see signs of the rapture and we say, ah, it won't happen. It'll never happen. That attitude is called complacence. Complacence is the greatest killer of human beings. Now, Iceland is under threat of a terrible volcano eruption. When a volcano erupts, they say, what kills the people the most is not the volcano or the pyroclastic flow or the ashes or the explosion, but complacence. Because the people who live around the volcano, they've got what is called a, a regular drill. Every week, there's a drill. You're living near a volcano, it can erupt any time. So we want to keep you ready. When we make this sound, immediately evacuate. Week after week, they go through this drill. After one year, when they hear that, ah, husband will tell the wife, I'm tired, I'm sleeping. You go for the drill. After a while, families will ignore the drill. They say, it's only a drill. We know that sound. We've been hearing that sound all the time. You know the boy who kept saying, tiger, tiger, tiger. And when the tiger really came, no one listened. So complacence means you're tired of hearing. When the preacher says, Jesus is coming soon, what does it mean? It means 
the sermon is finished. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, Jesus is coming soon. Let us get ready. That means close your Bible, zip up and get lost. Go and enjoy your lunch. We've got so used to hearing Jesus is coming soon. But we must not become complacent because one day the preacher will not be able to say it anymore. But he would have to say, Jesus has already come and woe to the preacher who's still there preaching. They knew not until the flood came. Look at how tragic that phrase is. Because Noah was preaching and the Spirit of God was striving. And yet they didn't realize it. How is it that this generation of Seth, forget the generation of Cain, how is it that so many of Noah's siblings, brothers and sisters, his uncles and aunties, so many of that generation of Seth who were walking with God, when Noah was preaching and the Spirit of God was striving, which is just like our grace dispensation, how is it that they could be so ignorant? The Bible calls this willing ignorance. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 5 For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. See, it's not that they are ignorant. Ignorance means you never knew. You can stand before God and say, God, I didn't know. Please have mercy on me. But here, they are willingly ignorant. That means you know it and you're deliberate. This is the hardening of heart. Any like that here? You know sin is wrong. You know unforgiveness is wrong. You know it can affect your life, your future, your eternity. And yet, sometimes we harden our hearts. Continue in secret sin. As long as nobody knows, I'm okay. So in other words, the ignorance of others is my innocence. I'm innocent as long as people don't know. Doesn't God know? Isn't the Spirit of God striving with you? Oh yes, He is. Your conscience pricks you, but you harden your heart. You are willingly ignorant. That's a very dangerous place to come to. So remember, this is not the sin of Cain's generation. The sin of Cain's generation is the violence and open sin out in the world. But this is the sin of the company of saints. To willingly ignore the truth, to harden our hearts. So Cain's generation is the largest generation and they are outside the church. When I say Cain's generation, I also include the generation of the other sons and daughters, but the Bible doesn't specify much about them. Let's club them all along with Cain. So that's the largest generation which is outside the church. But Seth's generation, they are inside the church. They are those who hear the truth, but will not believe because if they believe, they will act upon it. So they hear the truth, but they will not believe it. They see the ark, but they will not enter the ark. So, we want to look a little closer at this generation. Cain's generation will never see the kingdom of God. The people of the earth, the people of the world who sin, the generation of Cain are those. They will never see the kingdom of God. They will die in their sins and they will go to hell. It's an unspeakable tragedy. But the fact remains that's what the Bible says. But what do you know about the generation of Seth? They will see the kingdom of God but will not enter in. I will explain later how the generation of Seth were the most useful people in the church. But then we see another generation, Noah and his family. They will see the ark and 
they enter the ark. Does this remind you of something? In John's Gospel, chapter 3, we see of this generation, we see of those who will never see the kingdom of God, those who will see but not enter, and finally those who will enter. Noah's generation is the smallest generation who will see and enter the ark. So we've got three generations now. What are the three generations? The generations of Cain, the generation of Seth, and the generation of Noah. Which is the largest? Cain. Second? Seth. So it's in the order of the size also. The smallest of them is the generation of Noah. So look at these three generations. Cain's generation, totally out of the ark. They are not interested in the church. They are not interested in God. They may be atheists. They may be, I don't know, whatever. They, they may even be Christians who are not interested in Christ. Noah's generation are fully involved in the building of the ark. And they enter the ark. That means their heart and their mind and their life, they're all about God and they want to be with God forever. So Cain's generation completely out. Noah's generation completely in. Who's left? Seth's generation would never join Cain outside. They would never sin like those wicked, immoral people. Seth's generation were always proud of their moral uprightness. Oh, I'm not an adulterer. Oh, I will not sin like those people. Those are wicked people. They commit the worst sins. Thank God I'm not like them. They would never join Cain outside. Neither would they join Noah inside. They remained at a safe distance from Cain so that they would not be judged with Cain. But they remained a safe distance from the greatest saint of that time. Any of you keeping that safe distance? You don't sin like the people of the world, and yet you don't get too spiritual. You just want to keep a safe distance from everyone. I remember reading about the Titanic. The Titanic, the world's largest cruise liner, the world was so proud of it when it was constructed. And they had three classes. The, the superior first class, the very rich, very posh people. Then the second class, the mediocre, and then the very poor third class. Three classes when Titanic sailed. But when Titanic sank, there were only two classes. Did you know that? Yes. Before it, when it sailed, there were three classes, first, second, and third class. But when Titanic sank, there were only two classes, the lost and the saved. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how beautiful you are. It doesn't matter how famous you are. It doesn't matter how politically you have connections. It doesn't matter. When the door shuts, the only thing that matters, am I on this side or on that side? So, among the generation of this Seth were even Noah's siblings, which means Lamech, his sons and daughters. Think about that. They had the same upbringing as Noah. They were brought up under the teachings of their forefathers they saw their fathers who walked with God. And another thing about the ark. The ark was the size of a shopping complex. If you look at, is it Mustafa, uh, the, sh the shopping complex here. A shopping complex is so big, you can walk around, visit so many shops, but the ark of Noah was that size. How long does it take for a shopping complex to be constructed? Sorry? Around a year? Two years? 
and look at the modern machinery they use to construct it. In Noah's time, what machinery did they have? Nothing. So you can imagine, to build an ark of this size, how much help they would have needed. So I believe one old man and his three boys didn't build the ark. The sons of Seth helped to build the ark, but they themselves would not enter in. In the church today, there are saints who help in building other people's lives, but they themselves will not get built. In a home, in a family, the husband helps in building the wife. And she will enter the ark, but he will not. Are you such a husband? Or it could be the other way. The wife is constantly persecuting him and annoying him. You are building other people's lives, even as a as a church minister, I can be building up your life through my message. But I stand here in the fear of God, knowing very well that after preaching all these things, I can be left behind. And But through my sermon, you can be blessed. I don't want to be a fool at the end of my life. Doing a ministry is nothing if our life is not pleasing to God. It doesn't matter how big the church is. It doesn't matter how great the sermons we preach or we travel countries. All those things don't matter. What matters? Am I living a life that is pleasing to God? I can live a life pleasing to people. I can fool people. The best actors in the world are not in Hollywood or Bollywood or any other wood. They're in church. Some actors know they are acting, so they can stop acting. But what about the actors who are in a reality show where they don't even realize they are acting? So it does greatly matter. Are you in the generation of Seth? God may use you to build the ark, build other people's lives. But are you being built? Am I being built? My judgment will be so great because I preach the truth and yet if my life is not according to it and when I stand before God, what is he going to say? So the generation of Seth will not join Cain outside or Noah inside. They prefer the middle ground. So please, I beg of you, don't look at people who are worse than you. Don't look at those who have sinned and say, oh, they are so bad, thank God I'm not like them. Then we are like the Pharisee who took so much pleasure in his own moral righteousness and judged himself to be faithful before God simply because he found another man who was worse than he. Matthew Henry says, that it was with Seth's generation that the Spirit of God was striving in those days. What do you mean by striving? Striving means you keep on pleading, pleading, pleading. Come on, please, come, don't do that, don't. The Spirit of God was striving with that generation. How? By sending them Enoch and Noah and Lamech and all the other saints to preach to them. I wanted to observe that in that uh, Seth's generation, in every generation, you have a saint. We already saw their names. Let's look at those names again. This is the genealogy of Seth. Adam, Seth, Enos, Cainan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. I want you to consider these 10 men. I did my research and therefore I can vouch for what I'm going to say. These 10 names 
have meanings. So when they were born, their parents named them so apart from Adam. Their parents named them as God guided them. The meaning of Adam is man. That's all. Adam means man. What is the meaning of Seth? You see, when Seth was born, what did Eve say? Eve's heart was broken with the murder of Abel. Cain killed Abel, so she was very sad and broken. But when Seth was born, Eve said this, God has appointed me a son instead of Abel. So the meaning of Seth basically means appointment. So Seth is appointment. All right, the third man, Enos. Strangely, the meaning of Enos is mortality, or it means death. The meaning of Kainan is sorrow. I don't know the backstory and why the parents named them, but there was a reason. Some situation happened in that family for them to give such a name. Mahaliel, as you know, El. In the end, it means God. Mahaliel means one who is praised by God. Then comes Jared. The meaning of Jared is descending. There's a backstory to that, but I'm just keeping it brief. Jared means descending, or let us briefly say descends. Enoch, what a wonderful man of God he was, set apart to God the whole time. His parents didn't know that he would be like this, and he himself didn't know for 65 years. And yet God had a purpose for Enoch, and the meaning of Enoch is consecrated. Then Enoch gave birth to Methuselah. Methuselah... What's the meaning of Methuselah? I've already told you. Tell me, tell me who, who can tell me the meaning of Methuselah quickly? Tell me the full meaning of Methuselah. Uh, a little more. Ah, uh -huh. say that someone said it just now. Who's that? Ah, uh, see, when he dies, the flood will begin. That's the meaning of Methuselah. Strange, isn't it? So, Methuselah. At his death, the flood will begin. Methuselah basically, in, if you bring it short, it is just at his death. But the implication is clear. The flood will begin. Then there is Lamech. Lamech means poor and violent. Strange combination, but that's the meaning of Lamech. And the final man, Noah, is rest. So these are the names of the 10 saints in the generation of Seth. In the generation where the Spirit of God was striving and pleading with the people. But the amazing thing is, if you look at the names individually, they make no sense. But if you look at them together, you realize the entire gospel is hidden in this generation. Man has his appointment with death and sorrow. We are all appointed to die. But the one who is praised by God, that is Jesus, he descends, he is set apart. At his death, the poor and the violent will find rest. Do you see that? The whole gospel is contained in the names of these ten saints. What does that show us? It shows that God was pleading with this whole generation. The Spirit was dealing with them through the gospel of that time. Which also tells us, even though Adam sinned, it shows, and, the, and the mankind became sinful and rebellious, the plan of God did not change. 
In every generation, the gospel was given to them and it is the gospel that sets us free through the operation of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, listening to the gospel over and over is so important and the Spirit of God will sanctify us as we listen to this gospel, sanctify us through the word. But sets generations strangely, it is tragic and yet it speaks to us in fact, it reflects our own attitude. They would not listen to the gospel. They were not interested in the gospel. We are living in a time where churches are not even preaching the gospel. They discard it. It's not important. I've heard so many preachers, Pentecostal preachers, who don't preach about the cross anymore. They don't preach about the blood. They don't understand the purpose of the atonement of Christ. I myself was one of them until God opened my eyes to see the importance of the gospel. And I thought the gospel is simply one little message. But it is the rich truth of all New Testament preaching. It all comes out of the cross. There is so much in it that can blow our minds. And God gives the gospel. But today there are churches who will not listen to the gospel. And so God gives them preachers who will not preach the gospel. And I'll tell you something. If there is a church, I don't care if it's a Baptist or Pentecostal church. I don't care how spiritual people think they are. They may be a vibrant church, worshiping aloud, clapping, singing, prophesying, preaching, doing many things. They may be evangelizing, they may be multiplying, becoming the biggest church in their nation. I'll tell you something. This generation is the generation from which the Spirit withdrew himself. When God withdraws his Spirit from a church, what will happen to the church? Nothing. The church will continue. The spirit is gone. But the preacher will still preach. Singers will still, still sing. Musicians will play. PA people will do their work. All will sing and worship. What does that tell us? It tells us that we can do these things without the Holy Spirit. Look. I'm preaching to you. Now what if I say, Hallelujah, Amen, let's, let's clap, let's shout. You'll think I'm doing it in the spirit, right? I'm just acting. It's very much possible to fake the whole thing. When the spirit of God is knocking on a person's heart again and again and he finds that the person is not convicted, he's not responding, the Spirit of God never slams the door. The Spirit of God is a dove. He leaves very gently. And when he departs, you will never know it. Life will continue like for Samson. Samson was sinning over and over and over and over. And at one point, the Spirit of God departed from him. And he wished it not. That means he didn't know it. The Spirit of God can depart from a Pentecostal person. He will still speak in tongues. He may still prophesy. He can still do a lot of wonderful things. Spirit is gone. He's still doing it. The body without the Spirit is dead. A dead church can still appear to be very active. So let us think about it. Let our hearts be tender. Let us not harden our hearts to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let us be quick to repent. Quick to humble ourselves. The Spirit of God departed from Saul. We know all the story. I'm not going into those details. When the Spirit departed from Saul, an evil spirit troubled him. And it was David 
who knew these two stories of Samson and Saul. Samson was, an, we know his lifestyle, adulterous lifestyle. But Saul was not like that. But Saul had a different problem. His problem was his anger, his jealousy, wanting to kill. From these two giants, the spirit departed. One day David fell into a terrible sin. He committed the sin of Samson and he committed the sin of Saul. He fell into adultery, committed a murder and he knew he had done both. He was a combination of Saul and Samson. Instantly what was his prayer? He said, let not the Holy Spirit be taken from me because he saw what happened to Saul. David was the one who played the harp in the presence of this man. So David was so afraid, God, I know I hardened my ha heart and I fell into sin, but I plead, don't take your spirit away from me. Don't take away the joy of thy salvation from me. So we do not want to be like the generation of Seth who hardened their heart. So, may I ask you, to which generation do you belong? Do you belong to the generation of Cain? Do you belong to the generation of Seth? Or do you belong to the generation of Noah? When the spirit departs from a person, it means he feels no more conviction of sin. I feel that is the worst judgment. I remember once ministering to a believer who fell into the habit of drinking. And it affected him, his health, it affected his wife. And I was speaking to him. Of course, I tried in my own effort. I was telling him, brother, I want to tell you about hell because that's the place you are going. And I spoke to him a lot about hell, about how terrifying it is. And while talking to him, I was terrified because hell is a terrifying place. And halfway through that, he stopped me and said, Brother, I see how sincerely you're telling me what hell is like. But I just want to let you know, it is having no effect on me. I'm not scared of hell. If that's the place I'm going, I'll go there. Now that terrified me more than all. How hard can a man's heart be? When the spirit has gone, there will be no more conviction. Why I say this is the worst judgment is because it will affect the, it will affect you in relation to the rapture. You see, Paul says, I'll start off the verse, but you say the whole verse for me. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It stops there, yeah? Huh? Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So grieving the Holy Spirit of God is connected with our day of redemption. So if you look at that passage in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What he's saying is, if the Spirit is grieved with you, you will lose the rapture. How many of you want to be left behind? That's easier because no hands will go up. So you all want to be raptured? You all want to go when Jesus comes? Yes. Are you really serious? Yes. Okay, wait. Your yes between zero and hundred, how much is it? You all give the right answers. Are you really serious? Hundred percent you want to be raptured? Yes. Okay, let me take it from there. After saying this, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed the day of the redemption, then Paul gives us a list of things that will grieve the Holy Spirit. 
you look at the list and tell me what is the first thing in that list bitterness, bitterness. what is the last thing in that list forgiveness okay so paul begins the list and ends the list with the most important things in other words if you have bitterness now shall we have a test anybody has any bitterness against anyone raise your hand surely no one will raise your hand but you know you know your heart okay the spirit of god we know the nature of a dove it has no bile which is a bitter substance if we have bitterness we grieve the holy spirit when we grieve the holy spirit he's not going to leave us i don't want to tell you it's not a small thing for the holy spirit to leave he will not leave if you are a spirit baptized believer it's very hard for the holy spirit to leave you he loves you and he will strive with you paul says grieve not do you know the meaning of grieve you can grieve only the person who loves you you cannot grieve a stranger you can annoy a stranger you can upset a stranger but you can grieve only your family so you can grieve your father you can grieve your mother you can grieve your children or your parents or your siblings you cannot grieve a stranger so grieve not the holy spirit first of all tells you how much he loves you but if you rebel against him constantly disobey him harden your heart and quite often i have found that it is not the terrible sins that we do that grieves him but the way we deny that we are sinners that grieves him the way we our self righteousness can really grieve him so he loves you but don't grieve him because that will affect your rapture today i'm speaking to you all as a church we all have reasons to be bitter we can be bitter against different people because of what they did we have reasons to be hurt with them because they have dealt with us affected our lives you may feel once upon a time i was so privileged but today i am in this state because of so and so and we can be bitter and we may not even forgive how do we know we haven't forgiven because we will want them to suffer for what they have done but i want to tell you if you are harboring bitterness in your heart against anybody it could be a family member a friend a colleague a church member it could be anyone if you're harboring bitterness and you want them to suffer i want to make it very clear when you don't forgive a person that person is not the one who suffers you are the one who suffers not forgiving a person this is a very interesting uh comparison not forgiving a person is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die you are harboring anger and bitterness when you're not forgiving a person it means you will keep on thinking about that person your mind will think about that person then your heart will feel against that person your body also will react very often the body becomes sick because we haven't forgiven people i remember reading of a story of a um a cancer patient who testified and said that she had so much anger against people but by forgiving them she was healed and so she told her brother the same thing and then he told others they all experienced this and i heard of doctors who set up clinics and they said more than half of the patients who came to them were healed without a drop of medicine 
simply by practicing forgiveness. It doesn't even have to always be a Christian thing because according to the American Medical Association, nearly 90% of all sicknesses, chronic illnesses, come because of toxic emotions within us. So if you are keeping anger and bitter feelings against others, against others, you are suffering. And I was very impressed to know about the persecuted church. If you think of the Christians in Iran and other places, they are being persecuted so much. And every day we hear of people being tortured. Parents are watching children. In those days when, when terrorists used to break into homes, I heard of stories where little children, four and five years old, they were taken and their heads were slit, chopped off in front of the parents. Imagine the brokenness of the father and the mother seeing their child die like that. A horrible, painful death in front of them by these hardened people. Do you think it's easy for them to forgive these killers? What I discovered that in the persecuted church, the main theme of the preachers, the pastors of persecuted churches, they're doing an amazing ministry. It's not an easy ministry. What will they tell? Imagine, in Pakistan, one Sunday, people came and threw grenades and killed so many people. The people came, the, the others came back the following Sunday. What will the pastor preach to them? What message can he give to those who have been persecuted? I was amazed to find the main theme is not suffering for Christ, but forgiving those who persecute you. The process saying, forgiving your persecutors is far more important than all the pain you go through. Because the pain that you're going through is earning you a reward in heaven. But not forgiving them is depriving you of that inheritance. So, if you're finding it hard to forgive people, then think about Joseph. Joseph is known for his forgiveness. We all know Joseph is an epitome of forgiveness. But do you realize how hard Joseph found it to forgive what his brothers did to him? He was separated from his father. All these things hurt Joseph. Many of the things that you do wrong are because you are hurt. You're wounded inside. But don't use that as an excuse to sin. Joseph was hurt, he was wounded and he carried that pain for a long time. In fact, Joseph wanted to forgive, but he could not. How do we know? Because when he was naming his sons, he called them Manasseh and Ephraim. And the name itself tells you. He says, God help me forgive. You may try and try and try and fail. But where you fail, God will help you. And then you can say, God help me forgive. Let us therefore not be like Seth's generation, hardening our hearts, but let us desire to obey God. And that is why in verse 32, Ephesians, you, you, you've read up to, okay, read verse 32 there. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. How do you forgive? Carry on. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the gospel. You know that we are all under judgment. We are all under the wrath of God. We all deserve to go to hell. But how is it that God forgave us? For Jesus' sake, because Jesus bore that punishment. Read it. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It is for Christ's sake. So also you forgive others. That means just like God forgave you for Christ's sake. Let your heart. If your heart has been blessed by the truth of Calvary. Then you forgive others. I am going to close soon. But the, the question is. What does Calvary teach us? I have been preaching a lot about the gospel. And that is why, as I mentioned yesterday, if you want to hear it, you can hear it on the channel. K 
Calvary means a lot to me. And particularly, I remember when I was going through a very, very painful path, God spoke to me about being crucified with Christ. God didn't tell us, take up your Bible and preach. He said, take up the cross and follow me. A crucified life means denying what I feel is my right. I want justice. What your self demands, no. Let the self be crucified. Not I, but Christ. This is the work God will do in crucified saints. The Spirit of God can prepare only crucified saints for the rapture. There's no resurrection without crucifixion. So God will take a crucified saint and he will graft them into Noah's generation. So the three generations, what are the three generations of the flood? That's the title of my Bible study. What are the three generations? Cain, Seth, Noah. God, okay, do you belong to Cain's generation? How do you know? Ha uh ha. -huh. All of you said no straight away. Oh, I'm a Pentecostal believer. I've been attending this church for 257 years. Okay, I'll take it. You're not Cain's generation. All of you who said no, are you Seth's generation? Ha ha. All are silent because we all feel guilty, isn't it? Because we could very well belong to that generation. We help in building up the ark, in building up other lives, building up the church. We pay our tithes, we help in the ministries, we're doing all these things. Are you doing it to please God? Are you doing it in order to win some position in heaven? Or are you doing it because you love him? You heard the analogy yesterday, the two marriages. Seth's generation, very, very helpful. Great support for the work of God, but did not enter in. We don't want to be like them. So if, whose generation do you want to be part of? Noah. Noah's generation. So, if you belong to Seth's generation or Cain's generation, there is a way for us to be pulled out and grafted into Noah's generation. But for that... You must understand the importance of a crucified life. But in the light of this Bible study, I will explain it with a calculation and then I will finish. So there is an important calculation that I'm going to do. You don't need to do. You can just watch and see it unfold before your eyes. As I told you, all the people who lived in that generation, they lived for a long time. Noah's, sorry, Adam's son was alive for 160 years with Noah's father. So you can imagine, so they lived all long. But I want to make a statement here. Let me ask you, was Adam alive when Noah was born. How old was Adam when he died? Okay, 900 something. So could he have been alive? No. Why not? Okay, I'll make a statement. Adam died before Noah was born. And this is the calculation. You see, <clears throat> Adam lived to be 930 years old. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Then Adam was 235 when Seth gave birth to Enos. At that time, Seth was 105. Adam was 325 when Cainan was born. At that time, Seth was 195. Adam was 395 when Mahalel was born. Seth was 105. Oh, sorry, 200. Then Adam was 460 when Jared was born. So let me rush through that. Adam was 622 when Enoch was born. Adam was 687 when Methuselah was born. 
That's interesting, isn't it? When Methuselah was born, Adam was very much alive. He would live for nearly 300 years after that. Adam was 874 when Lamech was born. Then, Adam would have been 1056 years when Noah was born. But we know Adam died 900 something. What does that prove? Before Noah was born, Adam died. So he died at 930. Seth was 900, died at 912. So what does this calculation tell us? Adam missed seeing Noah by 126 years. Seth missed seeing Noah by 14 years. Now what I'm trying to say is this. Before Noah was born, Adam died. As I told you, Adam speaks of the old man. Old man, Adam, we, we know the doctrine. Adam is that old man. And before God could start the new world through Noah, with the birth of Noah, the beginning of Noah, that's the last generation or the rapture. Before God can start that new work in a person's life, the old man must die. To start a new work, the old work must stop. To establish the new covenant, the old covenant must cease. There's a 400 year gap between the Old and the New Testaments because God doesn't want an overlap between these two. When we become that new generation, then God will start that new work through us. Others will follow us. And I'm telling you this. When you love the gospel and when God starts the work in you, then he will do the work through you. He will touch other people. You will become a, a lighthouse to the neighbors and to the world. So God did this work in Noah just before the flood or before the rapture. There is a revival. Yes, before the rapture, there will be a revival in unexpected people in whom God is working. So as I conclude, let me tell you some interesting things. Okay. We can be like Cain's generation before the rapture. That means completely out. Or we can be like Seth's generation playing the hypocrite up and down. Don't condemn others. I'm talking about you and me. Or we can be like Noah's generation. Do you get the point? Completely out, red light, that's Cain's generation. Or completely in, the green light, like Noah's generation. When the light is yellow, sometimes you don't know to stop or go. Huh? You're in two minds. Huh? Shall I repent later or repent now? Can I enjoy the world? You know, let me. Oh yeah, I heard about forgiveness. Should I forgive now? How many of you will forgive next week? Yeah, amber, amber light shows that generation who will keep on postponing. So I'm about to end and I'm going to ask you a shocking question. But this time it's not a bad question, okay? You all know the story of Noah, right? Only Noah's generation was saved in the ark. But did you know after the flood, you know when the flood took place for more than a year, after the flood, it was discovered that some of Seth's generation survived. Now you say, brother, this is blasphemy. This is wrong doctrine. I'm telling you the absolute truth and you will, you will realize it and you will accept it also. After the flood, it was discovered that four people from Seth's generation had survived. You don't believe me? There were four women. Four women survived. Huh. You still didn't get it, did you? Noah's wife and his three daughters-in-law, they didn't belong to Noah's generation, did they? Where did they come from? They are from Seth's generation. But the amazing thing is this that they found a place in the ark. 
because they were married to Noah and his sons. Thank God there is hope for us. We can be in Seth's generation. But God is into the business of taking us out of that generation and bringing us into Noah's ark, into his generation. From the grasp of dead sea, exceeding joy will catch us up to glorious throne above, where we shall see him face to face in love. Come back quickly, Lord. We wait in day and night. Love in night, you will thy presence our delight to see thee face to Forever, oh, come back quickly, Lord, for thy 